everyone, and welcome once again to our pastor's Bible study. I'm Pastor Jim Testerman. Uh, with me, as always, Reverend Richard Y., uh, Reverend Trey Wooten, and Reverend Adam Lewandowski. We're going to be going through the Gospel Project. Uh, we're in Session uh, 2, uh, Unit 22. It is the uh, uh, it was the lesson for uh, uh, June the 14th. Is that correct? Yes, June the 14th. Uh, so we're going to be going through Mark uh, chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at the woman who had the, uh, the issue of blood for 12 years and Jairus' daughter. Uh, but before we get into God's Word, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, thankful to be in your presence and humbled that because of Christ's sacrifice, we can approach your throne of grace today. Lord, I Thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I thank you for the way that your Holy Spirit illuminates us uh, to the realities of this word. I thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus, through the Bible. And I pray, God, that during this time that you will help grow us. I pray for everyone that's listening or watching this, uh, this video uh, that your spirit will be with them and uh, and help them to to take in uh, the truths that you're going to reveal. Uh, help us to understand uh, more about you. Help us to understand a little more about ourselves. And uh, I pray, God, that uh, that as we study your word, that it would change us just as uh, you promised it would. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So who, who would like to read, uh, we're in uh, uh, Mark 5, and the, the background passage is 21 through 43, but uh, our lesson starts in verse 25, and the first section goes to verse 29. I'll, I'll go ahead and read this and get us going. All right, here we go, I'm on the wrong page. All right, so Mark chapter 5 beginning in verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Mm. Wow. Now, the, the, the part that we miss, uh, the part that, that uh, the first four verses before that, we see Jairus come up to Jesus and, and, and he says, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be made well and live. And then it says, and, and he went with him. Um, this is one of those s stories that has a sandwich structure where it starts in one direction and then goes in a different direction and then comes back to the original direction. Mm. Um, you know, Jairus uh, was a very wealthy, prominent man. He was probably the head ruler of a synagogue. Uh, that's a big deal. Mm. And uh, he... Jesus has just gotten done uh, healing a man um, that was uh, possessed by a legion of demons. Uh, prior to that, the disciples were out on the sea, and a huge storm comes up, and he, with his voice, he calms the wind and the waves. So what we're seeing here in Mark is like this, this miracle fest. Uh, Jesus' reputation is growing more and more people are hearing about him and more and more people are starting to come to him uh, as a result of that. I like uh, in here if you're not, if you read too fast you miss it but it says in verse 26 here she had spent everything that she had and was not mm -hmm. helped at all, it just got worse. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a great analogy for the gospel. Oh yeah. Um, you know, you can go through life uh, having an abundance of worldly possessions, material things, uh, but none of those things 
are going to amount to a hill of beans in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that truly matters is the gospel, uh, what Jesus did and what he's doing now, um, and your salvation. That is what's going to heal you ultimately. I think we mentioned in here before that people, us and many people, a lot of times things go wrong in our lives and we try all these other things mm -hmm. and we forget to go to the one thing we need to go to and that is Jesus first Amen. in prayer and asking for his help. And the, the, when you mentioned Adam, says so she spent everything, but then the next sentence says, having heard about Jesus. So we don't know when she exactly she heard about Jesus. We don't know if she um, heard about him before she spent all this money on the doctors trying to get healed, or if she heard about Jesus somewhere along in that path. And then she thought, oh, Jesus, he's coming to town. And what's interesting about this too is that she, like the story we, um, or the verses we talked about last time um, with leprosy. Mm -hmm. You know, she was um, outcast because she was supposed to stay away from people. She was supposed to be confined somewhere else, um, sheltered somewhere else, mm -hmm. and not out in the open. But here she knows these, this crowd's coming, she knows Jesus is coming, mm -hmm. and she took it upon herself to get close to that crowd, which is interesting too, because if they had known, and doesn't really tell us, but if they knew what was going on in, in her body, they probably would have kicked her out. Oh there. yeah, yeah. They, they, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have come in close contact with her. Get a, get away. Because from then us. they would have been rendered unclean. Yes. So you know, people that are suffering, or 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 they're outcasts, they need to hear about Jesus. It says later on here that before anyone anyone comes to Jesus' faith, they must first hear about him. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't know when she heard about him um, along this path. But she realized she did something. Nothing else is working. I don't know if she was looking at this as a last resort um, or if she just heard about Jesus. Right. Or it's the first time she's seen him, maybe. Maybe you know, it's the first time he's been in this particular area where she was. And she thought, well, this, it's either now or never. If yeah. only I can touch him. Yeah, she had re reached, well, both. Th there are so many comparisons here. Uh, Jairus and the woman had both reached a point of desperation. There's, there's nothing that says that Jairus really had faith in Jesus. I think that he probably heard just like the woman did. And, and he said, hey, what have I got to lose? Um, you know, Jesus had been accused of heresy. Now, if you know, Jairus was the, the ruler of the synagogue, it says it a couple times in here. Um, uh, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, and uh, it says over here in verse 38, they came to the house, the ruler of the, of the synagogue. So th they make sure, you know, that God makes sure that he lets us know who this guy is. Um, Jesus was a very controversial figure because he spoke truth. And he confronted the religious leaders of the day. If you, if you ever, when we read the Bible, we don't see Jesus confronting sinners in a, in a harsh way. He, he says, you know, hey, go and sin no more. He tells them, you know, what you're doing is sinful. Stop doing what you're doing. But he always ex he always expresses grace to them. With the religious leaders, the hypocrites, he rebuked them. I mean, he's got some harsh words for the, the religious leaders. So for Jairus, it's, it's almost like the Nicodemus thing where, you know, Nicodemus kind of said, hey, there's something about this guy. Mm -hmm. um, now, he may not have known uh, Jairus probably didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God and, and probably wouldn't have believed it if Jesus told him that. But he had reached a point of desperation. And that drove him to Christ. And to be quite frank, well, I believe that until we, and I mean mankind, reach a point of desperation, uh, kind of like David wretch in Psalm 51, where he cried out to God, where he had a broken and contrite spirit and he cried out for God to forgive him. It's that desperation where we desperately need grace mm -hmm. um, and that's where these two found themselves. And I think that this woman, she understood a truth that I think many people even as believers um, tend to forget and that's that when all is lost 
that Jesus is still reachable. Amen. The, um, I mean, we are, we're never too far gone to reach out for Jesus. So when your life is falling apart, Jesus is still reachable. I mean, all it takes is to, uh, to reach and find him is, is hearing his call, just looking for him, calling out to him, and asking for help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you figure, so in this story, um, and I think it's cool because Jesus is on, he's on the way to do one miracle. And and he, as God, he has such authority and power that while he's on the way to do one miracle, he does another miracle and then <laughs> continues to the next miracle. And what's cool about that, too, um, it, it just kind of shows, you know, God's, I guess, his omnipotence and his sovereignty because she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. Yeah. Okay, so she didn't come at him from the front. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't see her coming, but he did. Yeah, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it just shows God's unlimited mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. there. Okay. Um, when someone's coming up to you, just touching your clothes, and and they're healed. Right. Without even looking at her. Yeah. I, th I think that's really cool. It is. Um, some of the scholars on this uh, passage, when they write about it, they... um. Uh, they question, uh, you know, why was it that she actually reached out and touched his clothes? Mm -hmm. um, and they, they say it could be an act of humility on her part as well because she didn't want to stop him in his midst where he was, where he was heading to where he's going. She knew he was probably busy. Mm -hmm. uh, so she didn't want to say, hey, Jesus, will you stop? Will you heal me? So she figured she'll reach out and touch his clothes. And that's, that's when she realized that at that point she was healed as well. Well, and she had faith. She said... If I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Yeah, there were superstitions back in those days that if, if, if someone was righteous, if there was a prophet, that if you touched their clothing or if you were even in their shadow, mm -hmm. uh, that you could be healed. So she, she had what I would call an infantile faith, and we all have that at some point. Some people never outgrow that. Mm -hmm. Some people never mature in their faith. You know, they always have an infantile faith. And I... Faith is faith, so, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that as believers, we need to continue growing. She came to Jesus in faith. I believe he can heal me. She may not have known how. She may not have had her theological ducks in a row, but you don't have to to come to Jesus. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we shared the gospel and people say, well, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't know everything there is to know. Well, none of us do. Yeah. All we need to know is that Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior, and that we are sinners that are, we are 12 years uh, with, with the issue of blood. We are fathers who have children that are dying, and we need Jesus to intervene in our lives. You know, we're, we're the people that have legions of demons, and we need to be exercised of those. You, know, you look at, at the contradictions. So Jairus is rich. She's poor. Jairus is a leader. He's accepted. She's an outcast. Jairus has a family, and chances are this woman was alone. Um, you know, she, she, would, she would be barred from the temple. Uh, she would be barred from social interaction. She probably, if she had a husband, he probably left her. Mm. She probably didn't have children. You know, she, she had physical ailments that may have prevented her from, from having a child. Um, I mean, the, 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 it is a stark contrast. But it also goes to show us that it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done, when we reach out for Jesus, he responds to us mm -hmm. in grace. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. I read this quote, Jesus chooses not to leave people in the conditions in which he finds them. Amen. And we think back about these lessons we've been going over, and I think in every one of them, it's been a situation like that, where somebody came to Jesus, they had some kind of problem, and he didn't just say, okay, well, you know, I'll talk to you later. Or, right. You know, come back next week or something. Fill out a prayer like card. He, <laughs> he, he changed, changed that person right then and there. That's right. Or yeah. told him what to do to be changed. It but did, it was did, because of what he told him to do. Did it to me one day. Yeah, the cool thing is, that's what I say, the cool thing is he still does that. Yeah. Every day. You know, when, when someone is saved or quickened from death mm -hmm. uh, to life, that is Jesus uh, intervening. And coming to their rescue. Yeah. And it happens in an instant. Yeah. 
Yeah, desperation is often a prelude to grace, and and I found that in my own life. That's it, right. It was when I when I realized that I was a sinner, when I realized that I needed to be saved. There was desperation, sure, in in, in my heart, and and hopefully that desperation will never wane in me. I mean, I still feel I'm still desperate for Jesus. And the more you learn about Him, and the more you grow in your faith, mm-hmm. the more you realize. The, the level of his grace. Right. Now, just imagine if you were Jairus, right? Like, your little your little girl's dying. Mm-hmm. You get the attention of this miracle worker, and he immediately, you know, he immediately, okay, let's go to your house. And he starts, and all of a sudden, this, this lady, this outcast, this, uh, uh, you know, in their society, she was throwaway. She was expendable, or I should say disposable. Uh, she reaches out, and she, like, she she undoes what you guys are doing. You know, Jesus stops. Is he going to keep going, or is he going to get distracted? Uh, Jairus is probably beside himself uh, because of this. Uh, but that's what Jesus does. He, he attends to those who need his grace and his mercy. It was probably pretty quick, you know, because, you know, there's nothing in between these verses that we read. Um, I mean, she touched him. Who did that? Mm-hmm. And basically, you know, they're going away again. Right. And um, so it's probably pretty quick, which reminds us that people can be saved instantly mm-hmm. once they hear Jesus speak to their heart. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't, doesn't have to wait until, oh, I'll, I'll wait till next week or anything like which is dangerous. Um, it happens instantly. Right. Well, she reached out and touched him. Right. She took that, she, she made a, a, an effort to respond to the presence of God. And that's the, that's what we must do when we feel the presence of God, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we have to reach out. And, and he, he will always be there with that nail-scarred hand uh, to, to embrace us and to save us. And that uh, that's the good news. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the gospel. Mm-hmm. I mean, immediately. She's healed, and she feels it. Can you imagine that? I mean, you know, last week when we talked about the lepers, and, and I made the comment that, you know, Jesus did more than just heal them of leprosy. He gave them their lives back. Um, uh, you know, this woman, we don't know how old she is, but she's suffered for 12 years. Um, I'm, I'm sure that she's seen people holding babies, and, you know, it probably broke her heart. Uh, I want a family of my own. I wish I could... I wish I could have that. I mean, that, back in those days, being barren and being uh, unmarried, not, not good. Right. Those are those are two more customary shunnings, you know, mm-hmm. because children are looked at as a blessing mm-hmm. from God. So if you don't have, if you're barren, it looks as if you know God is not blessing you. But what Jesus did when He healed her, and and I believe that when Jesus heals you, He heals you completely. So chances are she was probably able to conceive a child. So she may have gone out and gotten married. She might have had that baby that she wanted all her life. She may have had a family. I mean, when when Jesus heals you, you get more than just the immediate healing. Uh, there's always the add-on. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And that is a perfect illustration, in my mind, of that verse. You know, with the lepers, there were ten of them. And so they had a, I don't know, their, their little community. That's all they had, but they had that group of people. She had no one right? Um, that, that we know about. She was all alone. Um, and as I said, you know, this has been going on for 12 years. And she was very desperate at this point. And that's a lot of people these days... They get desperate because things go wrong in their lives for so long, and they, as we read about, they hit bottom, and then they realize now's the time. They have to do something. Right. They have, may not know what right in there, but they have yeah. to do something. Yeah, uh, it's, it's called a moment bottom. of clarity. Some people have that moment. Uh, that's uh, in the in the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, jargon. That's that's what they call it, um, where the person looks at themselves in a mirror and says. I've got a problem. 
you know you have that moment of clarity and we all have problems it may not be a alcohol addiction or a chemical addiction or a food addiction but we all have sin and it all at some point has to be dealt with and that moment of clarity where we say to ourselves i'm lost and i need to be found and we reach out for jesus that's that's a beautiful thing she kind of snuck in through that crowd too um to touching and without again unlike the lepers that they had 10 of them together they were a team i guess you could say. yeah they had like a community of misery but um <laughs> she's all alone and um so she had to kind of weave through the crowd to get in there but she knew what she was after she yeah. knew what she needed to um, get to well and when we we did our study on john 4 the woman at the well we talked about how Jesus crossed all these ethical uh, barriers, all these racial barriers, gender barriers to reach this woman. Well, this this woman here did the exact same thing. Um, if, if she was she would, first of all, she shouldn't have been talking to a man because that was just not culturally accepted. Uh, touching him, certainly not. Here he, he was a rabbi, and she is an unclean person. So she is going to. In, in the Jewish mindset, defile someone who is righteous. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened was Jesus took her suffering, he took her unrighteousness, and impugned to her his. That's what he does with us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this woman, yeah, Richard, she she went after it. I mean, she, uh, she was tired of living the way that she lived. She was tired of suffering like she was suffering, and she was going to do something about it. Uh, thankfully for her, Jesus did something about it for her. <laughs> and her touching him did not make him dirty, but his cleanliness made her clean. Correct. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> okay. Verse 30. At once Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. He said that to the... uh, the Samaritan leper uh, that mm-hmm. we talked about the other day mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, your faith has saved you. So-so. So it wasn't just about um, being healed temporarily in the flesh. It was about being saved. Yeah. Having faith in yeah. the Son of God. Yeah, she did what the, what the Samaritan leper did. She mm-hmm. came, she fell at his feet, she recognized him for who he was. She knew that he was her healer. That's right. And she confessed that, I'm sure. Um, she was probably overwhelmed, you know. She said, uh, with fear and trembling, uh, realizing what had happened to her, came and, and fell down before him. Mm-hmm. So she was overwhelmed with emotion. There's no doubt she was just uh, amazed by him. I think it's probably an Isaiah 6 moment. Mm. You know, uh, she. She was standing before the throne of God, and she fell down because that's really our only appropriate response to Jesus. That's right. It is to bow down before him. Um, so she, she confesses everything. He welcomes her into their kingdom. He commends her faith, and he, he blesses her with a shalom. You know, go in peace. Um, yeah, I think it's important to point out, too, um, in verse 34, where he calls her uh, daughter. Yeah, daughter. And this is the only time in the New Testament that Jesus refers to another lady uh, as daughter, That's right. such as this. The, um, and then also, uh, we talked about your faith has healed you. And, um, and uh, if you go back and look at the original language, the word for healed is the same as the word for saved. So that it's also looking at the, um, uh, it indicates the physical and the spiritual aspects of what took place. Right. Interesting that Jesus, and, and I, it's funny, I had that in my notes, that the only time he calls somebody daughter. Um, I find it, uh, again, uh, weaving this thread through this story that Jesus calls her daughter, 
and now he's going to go raise Jairus's daughter from the dead. Mm -hmm. So we have this this daughter theme through here. Um, you know that I guess a casual. That's why we should never casually read the Bible. Uh, we should always read every word. Every word's in there for a reason. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and uh, uh, it, I, I think it's. I think it shows such compassion. That's uh, to call someone son or daughter and mean it. Somebody who's not your physical biological child. Uh, there's a there's a young man here at church that I've known since he was seven or eight. He's 21 now. And, um, sometimes I put my arm around him and I call him son. And, and and he told me one day he said that means so much to me. He said because you you genuinely mean that you care about me, and that's what. That's what Jesus does. He he takes a woman that has been uh, ignored. She's been reviled. She's been outcast. She's not invited to parties. She, nobody wants her around. She probably doesn't have a job. She's probably homeless. She probably begs for food, begs for money. Um, and suddenly, here is Jesus not only healing her, but showing her incredible compassion and calling her daughter, as if Jesus has just welcomed her into his family, which he did. He did. He did. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can only imagine what that felt like to that woman, to, to know, wow, I, I'm accepted. You know, No longer do I have to lurk in shadows like the lepers. You know, she got her life back, and, and then some. And he made her whole again. Mm. Amen. And she represents all of us. I mean, this is a perfect illustration of of who we are before we come to know Jesus and who we are after we come to know Christ. Well, I think also if you look at uh, where it said he told her the, uh, I mean, that she told him the whole truth. So she wanted to share everything that had taken place um all the way from what had happened to her, as far as she knew, all the way up to where she was at that point. And um, so basically what she was doing is um, she was sharing her testimony right. of faith. That's right. With all that were, that were, all that were standing there. So Because Jesus obviously knew everything. Sure. They, uh, but he wanted her to explain in front of those people that were all around what was taking place. Yeah. Which is kind of unusual because usually Jesus would say, you know, go, don't say anything to anybody, don't, don't cause commotion. Uh, he didn't do that. That's right. He didn't do it. Um, you know, she had, she had done everything that she could do uh, to be made well. Everything that she thought she could do. She'd spent all of her money. Um, you know, the, the doctors may or may not have tried, probably didn't know what to do, uh, maybe didn't want to be bothered by her. Uh, happy to take uh, her cash, but not really offering any help. Right. And suddenly, Jesus comes onto the scene and instead of taking from her he gives her back so much more than mm -hmm. she could ever imagine um, and that's what he does to all of us I mean when we we reach out to, to touch Jesus he's going to reach back he will always always respond to us there was another case also the disciples not quite understanding what just took place mm -hmm. and yeah. almost rebuking him yeah because they said, what do you mean you know, who touched you? Oh, look all these people around there. They're all touching you. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't know what he was talking about. They rarely did. Yeah, Jesus was saying, who touched me with intent? Right. But it, but it wasn't Yeah, it wasn't like he didn't already know. Oh, he knew. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think he was saying that for the disciples' yeah. benefit. Yeah. It's funny, you know, the disciples, they get beat up on so much. But <laughs> i got to be honest. I, I have the... I have an advantage that they don't have. I mean, I got the whole book. Oh yeah. Uh, and and I got I sometimes sit and think, well, Jesus, why would you want me to do that? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't I don't I don't think that we can really beat up on disciples uh, because we are disciples and sure. and we're just as hard headed uh, and disobedient <laughs> and and unknowing as they were, and we have less excuse. <laughs> because we do have a canonized Bible. <laughs> yeah. But boy, we do see them grow uh, throughout all of this. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, John, all, all I mean, you, 
you Paul, you read all the the New Testament and you see guys, uh, Peter, who was so uh, so easily angered, uh, had ill tempered, he was quick to respond, and and all of a sudden, yeah, you see this one eighty, and when you read First and Second Peter, and, and you see this man who has mellowed, oh, yeah. he has been mellowed by the Holy Spirit over his life, uh, you know, kind of like a, a baker needs dough, and that's kind of what happened to Peter. He was, he was worked on by the Holy Spirit until uh, it, it completely changed him from the inside out. That, that work of sanctification really, really, it's really evident in his writings. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to verse 35. Uh, 35 and 36, and then 39 through 42. I'll, I'll read this part. Uh, verse 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Verse 39. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but sleeping. That rhymes, by the way. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a great piece of scripture right there. Yeah. Um, that, that's, like I said, Jairus was probably really upset. Um, you know, he, he, he got Jesus' attention, and then all of a sudden, here's this lady. And he's probably thinking, lady, you've bled for 12 years. You can wait 30 minutes more. Um, but that wasn't Jesus' plan. Two things that struck me in these verses. One is when they laughed at Jesus, mm -hmm. they they did not realize who Jesus was or what he could do, apparently. And so when he told them that she was simply sleeping, they laughed at him. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine somebody laughing at, at that point here. They were crying. They were crying out. Next second, they're laughing. Mm -hmm. And I read about professional mourners. Yes, I read about that. And, too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people were paid to mourn at somebody's death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So some of these were probably these professional paid mourners, because why else would they go from weeping to laughing? Yeah. Well, and, you, I, I think of Jesus on the cross and the, and the mockers who stood and and mocked him and laughed at him and right. scorned him. Think about how inappropriate that is. Oh. Yeah. You know. Goodness, Goodness uh, it was a different culture back then. Just uh, you know, you could chalk it up to culture. I don't know. People you know. are rotten. They always have been. <laughs> you know, yeah. Solomon said, "There's nothing new under the sun." True. Yeah, we we may have new technology, but we're the we are the same people that laughed at Jesus. I mean, True. it's just the way it is. Yeah. Cynical, sarcastic, and you do see a lot of people laughing in funeral homes. You know, mm -hmm. during viewings and stuff. Mm -hmm. You can go from crying to laughing. Right. So here Jairus has, has, has this news that, uh, you know, my daughter is dying. And then somebody comes out, hey, don't bother Jesus anymore. She's dead. Uh, that, that wasn't the most compassionate <laughs> way to tell the guy, hey, your kid's dead. Leave Jesus alone. Hey, hey you don't need him now. You don't need this, you know, this sideshow miracle worker. Uh, you got mourners at your house. Your kid's dead. And uh, so all of a sudden, the desperation of Jairus gets elevated. There is there is an elevation and, it, and a letdown because all of his hope's gone. You know, uh, 12 years, just like the woman bled for 12 years. Uh, this child is 12 years old. She had a life. And now it is gone. Um, uh, Jesus... I believe, responds to Jairus with a challenge. Um, don't be afraid. 
Right. He, he's like, hey, look, I, I work in my own time. I'm not on your timetable. I'm on my own timetable. I'm not going to be hurried. I'm not going to be dictated to. Just believe and watch what I do. Yeah, so, I mean, because he told me that only believe. So he was um, basically asking Jairus for more than just a single act of belief. He, he wanted that um, uh, what, a continuous, a steady belief going. Yes. And uh, not just believing right now, but I want you to believe me as we go all the way through this whole situation. Mm-hmm. But Jerry did not stop Jesus. He didn't say, okay, well, never mind. You know, I don't need, right. to, need it anymore. He, there's nothing in here to indicate anything like that. Mm-hmm. But what you just said, Jim, I read, God may not come when you call him, but he'll be there at the right time. Amen. And Martha and Mary figured that out. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Um, but I know now, I know that even now, that God will give you whatever you, whatever you ask for. Um, you know, but there's an old song, uh, uh, even when he's four days late, he's right on time. <laughs> Remember, Alyssa Holbrook used to sing that song all the time. Um, the, the funny thing is, if we want to call it funny, you know, uh, they laugh at Jesus and he just rebukes them. He's like, mm-hmm. Mom, Dad, Peter, James, John, come on, we're going in. Well, you're going to see the power of God. So Jairus is no longer praying for a healing. Now he's praying for a resurrection. And, and this is where the story really comes to its zenith, I think, um, because we see this little girl uh, brought back to life. She was dead. And Jesus puts his hand on her. And it's funny because uh, Talitha Kume, uh, some of the uh, translators, you know, young girl, little girl, literally it means little lamb. And I think that's precious. Mm -hmm. You know, he he calls the the woman who bled daughter, he's calling this this child little lamb. Little little lamb, get up, come on. And she comes back to life. so in this in this exchange, we see Jesus giving two people their lives back, literally. Um, one, one physically and emotionally and and, and societally, and and the other one a literal physical resurrection. Um, yeah, and and all and I think, just me, I, I think that Jesus is doing this as a precursor to his resurrection. And when he stood in John 11 and said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Uh, he's trying to get, I think he's trying to get these disciples to finally say, hey, we're starting to catch on here. You know, Jesus isn't, he hasn't come to kick Rome out of uh, Galilee. He, he's come to free us from sin, sorrow, and death. Uh, I think that's remarkable. Mm. And, and, and what what really amazes me here is thinking of, of that little girl. Okay, she's dead. She's laying there. Jesus takes her by the hand. He calls to her. And uh, suddenly she's brought back to life. Can you imagine opening your eyes mm-hmm. and seeing Jesus standing there? Oh, all of us are going to experience that one day. I mean, this is a precursor to what every believer in Jesus is going to experience sometime. Because death is going to come, we're going to fall asleep, and when we open up our eyes, we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 tells us that. Um, I mean, that is absolutely awesome. Uh, I can only imagine what it would be like to open up my eyes and have my Lord stand in front of me. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That's really cool. Were you able to find anything that connected her 12 years with the girls 12 years of age? I, I don't know if that's anything significant. I don't, I'm sure it is, but well, I don't know what. I, you know, I think it goes in, in these lines of comparisons of, of the daughter theme, the 12 year theme. You know, the, the little girl was a joy for 12 years. This woman had been miserable for 12 mm-hmm. years. And I think that it's uh, it goes back to the to the comparison of the woman 
and Jairus. You know, uh, he had 12 years of joy that is suddenly being taken from him. And Jesus gives it back. This woman had had 12 years of misery. Jesus took that away from her and gave her the rest of her life back. Mm. I think this, I guess to, to boil it down, um, when we think about what does this text teach me about God, uh, it teaches me that God honors the faith of those who reach out to him. Everybody that comes to him, he honors that. It doesn't matter what your social status, your gender, your physical condition, uh, what sins you've committed. You know, if if Jesus knew everything that I've done, he'd never say me. Well, Jesus does. Jesus does know everything you've done. Uh, I may not know what, what you've done, and you may not know what I've done, but Jesus knows what we've all done, and he still offers us grace. I mean, the fact to know that, that Jesus saved a wretch just as me, um, one, it humbles me, it amazes me, and it gives me hope for everybody else in the world. You know, when we go out and evangelize, I tell people, if Jesus can save me, it save you. <laughs> it also reminds us when it talks about it in here, when something goes wrong in our lives, sometimes we forget, like like I said earlier, we forget to pray um, immediately. We, we wait to we try everything else, and then we pray, and say, oh, I try this. Well, when something goes wrong in our lives, it's difficult um, to see what God has in mind. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to, for us to look ahead because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right. So it's hard, hard for us. And those are the times that most people will come closer to God because they say, okay, yeah, God, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. I can't do this alone. You need to take over. And when God takes over, hopefully they give God the glory for that. Amen. But sometimes we forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus cares for the hurting, and and he operates on his own timeline. And sometimes that drives me crazy, because I want God to operate on my timeline. You know, I have a schedule. (laughs) I have things that I want to do. I don't have time for this sickness. I don't have time for this, uh, you know, uh, imposition um, God, heal me and do it now. Or the old, the old saying, God, uh, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> he operates on his own timeline. He is, he is not our bellhop. He is not our butler. Uh, he's not a genie in a bottle. Um, but uh, for those who come to Jesus, for those who trust in Jesus, he will immediately respond and, and reach out with a healing hand to save you. And, and his authority and power are absolute. Um, just like this woman who touches him and it says Jesus felt power go out of him. He, he gives power to the powerless. That's what he did for this lady. And but You can't get more powerless than a dead kid. You know, a dead little girl. Uh, and uh, Jesus gave those parents back that, that wonderful gift that they figured they'd lost forever. Anybody want to pray us out? I will. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, thanking you first of all for saving us. We thank you for the suffering you did for us on that cross and taking our sins upon yourself. And dear Lord, we know you have promised us uh, a glorified body one day, a place in heaven that you've prepared for us. But dear Lord, before we get there, we will have trials, we will have tribulations, we will have problems. But dear Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you, help us have faith in you, as this this lady that we talked about today did, and as Jairus did when he went to Jesus, he knew that Jesus was the one that could save his little girl. So, dear Lord, we know that everything's in your hands. We know that you know everything that's going on. We can know you can heal all things. So we just thank you, give you the glory and praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.